Excited to have the founder of the Animal Activist Legal Defense Project with us. This is a very exciting project as it is creating a whole new generation of animal rights attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us, Carter Dillard, who is really a renowned attorney. If I were to read your bio, we'd be here all day and run out of time. Uh, but tell us what is this incredible new project of yours and what does it hope to achieve? Well, thanks so much for having me on, Jane. And the Animal Activist Legal Defense Project is housed at the University of Denver, the Sturm College of Law. And, and can I just ask you to just look in the camera eye, which is straight above yeah. you, right there. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in short, it's to provide uh, legal defense services to animal activists, frontline activists that are the ones documenting and reporting out on institutional and other forms of animal abuse around the country. And I, I do want to make clear, really, the project's largely the work of a lot of other people. Uh, Professor Justin Marceau at the University of Denver, who you probably know, um, really, he was the one behind the AGAG constitutional victories in many other cases, as well as the author of several books, including Beyond Cages. Jennifer Jones Bonino, a wonderful civil rights attorney. Chris Carraway, a decorated criminal defense attorney. So it's a lot of people. I'm just lucky to join them at the university so that we can provide the services that will enable activists to continue to document the abuse out there. Well, and there is so much abuse to talk about. Uh, my gosh, there's just a breaking news story that was in the New York Times about gas chambers that are used uh, in the pig slaughter industry. And this has created shockwaves um, San Francisco Chronicle has reported this undercover investigation uh, of a, an activist from Direct Action Everywhere sneaking into Farmer John and uh, putting in hidden cameras, spy cams, to reveal, according to Wired, which did an in-depth article, the grim reality of slaughterhouse gas chambers. So obviously this... Uh, involves the law. Is it legal? Isn't it legal? The corporation says it's absolutely legal. Smithfield, by the way, is invited on Unchained TV ever anytime to discuss this further, says it's approved by the USDA and it's fine. And yet um, what has been revealed, the footage is horrifying. Uh, I think the headlines speak for it. I won't uh, subject you to it, but pigs being asphyxiated um, screaming at the top of their lungs. Uh, it's hard to even edit it. So where does the law come in with something like that? And how would your new organization uh, be able to uh, facilitate having this discussed in a court of law? Sure. I mean, I think the first thing to remember, DXC and other groups are really helping to lead the animal rights movement by being the ones taking the risks on the front line to document what you're seeing there. First point. Second point is activists around the country need criminal defense in order to continue doing what they're doing. All of these places would be black boxes in which we would never see what's going on if these activists didn't have proper defense. Uh, and so the project is going to network across the country with attorneys to make sure that activists can continue doing what they're doing within the confines of the law, but certainly investigations uh, usually qualify. Third is that Jane, I've run undercover investigations for two decades in factory farms, and I've never put an investigator in a facility where I didn't document something that I think could have been prosecuted as animal cruelty. Even in states where there, where there are institutional exemptions, those exemptions are not absolute. There are limits to the exemptions. And things like AVMA or USDA sign off on blatant cruelty is not enough to exempt from prosecution. The reason these places are not prosecuted is not because of the law. It's because prosecutors aren't doing this work because it's politically difficult. But activist groups telling the truth is what builds up a social justice movement. And eventually prosecutors feel political pressure to do the right thing. So, yes, absolutely. The project not only will defend the activists, but it will assist them uh, finding lawyers in the network to help them present their evidence to prosecutors to sue companies when prosecutors don't act where there are civil causes of action and to tell the story. Because I'll, I'll end this part by saying, Jane, I think 
that animal rights is clearly, clearly part of a larger social justice movement. It's the idea that violent forms of oppression uh, put upon individuals who are innocent, including animals, um, that's oppression. And if we can document, expose, uh, and ideally end oppression, that's all part of social justice. So part of the project's goals are, are to include animal rights in that larger, larger vision of social justice um, and I think the you know what you're seeing these activists document um, is is the kind of information that drives this social movement. So we're indebted to them. Now uh, you are absolutely right that all sorts of organizations, gee, myself included, um, almost every day there's something that we say, wow, we'd love to get a legal opinion on this, but legal opinions are expensive. And so, how are you in creating this new generation of animal rights lawyers going to fund all this? Because a lot of the questions come from organizations that are operating on a shoestring with mostly volunteers. That's absolutely right. I mean, there is a tradition among lawyers of doing pro bono work, right? You're, uh, as a lawyer, you're really an agent of the state operating within the system, but you're there ideally to ensure that justice is done. And so there should be a lot of appeal for attorneys that want to offer pro bono services. They can often afford to because they're making good money. And animal activists are the perfect sort of next generation of social movement activists that we think lawyers will engage pro bono. We've already had success getting some of the cases placed on a pro bono basis. And where there's not pro bono, there is a, a, lot, a fair amount of funding to support activists. Now I'll say they're, they're, we need partners in this process. One of the obvious partners are any companies that are producing humane products or services, right? A lot of companies that are producing vegan products benefit from activists taking these risks. And I mean risks, Jane, these, these kids in many cases are looking at felony prosecutions. These companies benefit from the exposés that are happening. They're selling uh, humane products because consumers are realizing just how bad animal products are, how they're produced through blatant cruelty. So we need the support of the companies that are making money through the sale of humane products because it's really the activists that are helping them make those sales. Another partner that we need in this, in this work are unions. We need labor unions inside factory farms, inside other forms of uh, other forms of institutionalized animal cruelty, workers that are working in those, those facilities that are unionized. And even if they're not, if they're going to be unionized, we need them to come forward and partner with us to help provide evidence uh, and, and to provide some of the deep access information that even activists can't get to. Um, and another area of partnership we need are the attorneys that are used to doing social justice work, like indigent defense, death penalty defense, other forms of social justice work that they should see protecting non-humans as part of that. And so if we can partner with these groups um, and rely really on, on attorneys' commitment to justice, I think we'll have the support we need to expand a foundation of support for activists around the country to enable them to do this work. Because without it, there is no animal rights movement. You are absolutely right. It's really going, animal rights is going into the courtroom big time. We're going to talk about the trial of Alexandra Paul, the Baywatch actress, that's coming up March 7th here in California. We've got a caller, Lindsay from Encino. Your question or thought for Carter Dillard, who is uh, one of the leaders of Animal Activist Legal Defense Project, a new project. And by the way, if you're attorneys, people, reach out because, as you just heard, they need pro bono attorneys. Lindsay? Yes, I wanted to thank you so much for doing this, and um, I hope that many attorneys will take heed and help out. But my question is, what's happening with Prop 12 and the gestation, the horrific gestation crate? Sure. Great question, uh, Lindsay. So we're still waiting for the well, Let's explain Prop 12 for a second for those who don't know. And sorry to interrupt you, Carter, sure. but it was passed by the California voters overwhelmingly. And basically, they were saying they don't want um, the uh, humane practices that are um, really standard in factory farming like pig gestation crates right and battery cages for chickens they don't want that being sold here in california i mean that's just really simplifying it but 
Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carter. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's it's um, when consumers, when voters find out how their food, how other products are actually produced in these uh, otherwise invisible facilities filled with millions of animals, uh, they usually stop buying the products or they'll switch to a better alternative because I don't think good people really want to pay for and encourage cruelty to innocent creatures. But that's what happens when you're buying these products inevitably. And the, when California and its voter base moved to improve the standards with which these animals are treated, it, it triggers a question under federal law in terms of who has the authority to, to regulate, in essence, uh, animal treatment, animal production, uh, and, and you know, the trafficking of, of cruel products, in essence. And so that question about who has authority here is before the Supreme Court. Last I checked is they were still expecting an, a ruling pretty imminently, but the court is to rule on really whether California has authority to do what it's doing. Um, and I would just tell anyone that cares about animals, look, regardless of what happens, there are opportunities to make these changes in other states. California was always meant to be one of many states that would make these reforms. Um, and ideally, if you look at leaders like Cory Booker at the federal level, we can also start to encourage Congress to engage in reforming institutional animal cruelty. Because here's the good news. I'll just end by saying this. Here's the good news. For lots of reasons, the cost of being cruel and producing animals is going up environmentally, and otherwise, whereas the cost of producing relatively humane products, certainly humane products like vegan products, that is generally going down. And this industry is, is not long for the world. It's just a matter of how quickly we can end the abuse. And a lot of that involves working at your state level and with your congressperson to support all forms of legislation, regardless of what's going on in the Supreme Court. Yeah, I want to double back to Prop 12 because it's really sad that the administration, the Biden administration, has basically come out against it and come out in favor of uh, having uh, the voters' will overturned. Uh, let's go to our next caller, Michelle in Los Angeles. Your question or thought for Carter Dillard of the amazing new Animal Activist Legal Defense Project. Hi, thank you so much for all you do, Carter, and the whole group. Um, pig piggybacking on what Lindsay was talking about, what what is going to happen with the new revelations about the undercover investigation with the pig gas chambers? Like, are they going to be legally, can there be something legally done about that? There can be. Yeah, there certainly can be. I mean, normally activists are really obligated to present all of the information to prosecutors first uh, and give prosecutors a chance to do their jobs uh, and to prosecute animal cruelty. And while we're, we're familiar with seeing prosecution of things like uh, individuals acting out against companion animals, um, we, we rarely, if ever, see companies, which are the really the ones who commit most animal cruelty. We're talking millions of animals subjected to cruelty at once. Um, we rarely see them prosecuted, but it's up to activists to present the evidence. And if they don't, um, I mean, if prosecutors don't prosecute the cases, really there has to be political pressure on them to explain why they didn't do so, what sorts of conflicts of interest they have. I mean, remember, a lot of these companies are uh, you know, funding campaigns. They're large employers in the area. But what, what is rarely the case is that there's an actual legal, a very good legal reason for not prosecuting the companies. I've seen investigations of animal cruelty in hundreds of companies, like what you saw, Michelle. And I rarely see prosecutors prosecuting, and it's because of political reasons. They simply don't feel enough pressure to do so. And so a, a, a second alternative, if you can't get a prosecution, is oftentimes companies are engaged in blatant false advertising about their products. Oftentimes, when they're violating state criminal laws, they're also subject to civil injunction. You can sue them to stop the cruelty, even if they won't be prosecuted for it. Uh, and you'll see that in some places around the country. So I think, yes, either way, 
there ought to be a serious look at whether there are grounds for prosecution and then definitely uh, whether there's additionally grounds for civil litigation against these companies because they're not feeling the heat right now. But again, as we build up the base of lawyers around the country to support activists, we think that that they will start to feel the heat. Yes. And let's uh, just give people an insight into what we're talking about. Recently, uh, at the Farmer John Slaughterhouse near downtown L.A., uh, Raven Deerbrook with Direct Action Everywhere infiltrated the facility and placed hidden cameras inside the carbon dioxide gas chamber or placed hidden cameras in order to record what happens inside this box, essentially. Now, the USDA is supposed to monitor what happens to animals in factory farms and slaughterhouses, but according to her, there were no cameras inside the box. So in other words, the company was saying, uh, this is humane, this is legal, this is approved by the USDA, but the claim of DXC is that there were no cameras in there. So how would they know that it's humane? And what they found was uh, pretty, uh, geez, horrific. My name is Raven Deerbrook. I'm an undercover investigator. And while working in Los Angeles, I gained access to one of the most secretive aspects of the slaughter industry, the gas chambers used on pigs. And, you know, uh, we invite Smithfield on any time. They have said and issued a statement, which they gave to Wired Magazine, which did an in-depth article on this. They said um, they're committed to safety, health and comfort of our animals and strictly follow approved laws, regulations and best practices for humane animal stunning prior to harvest. We adhere to all humane handling and stunning regulations for livestock with the oversight of the USDA Food and Safety Inspection Service and that the USDA and the AVMA American Veterinary Medicine Association recognize carbon dioxide gas chambers as complying with humane slaughter laws. And what DXC is saying, and we invite Smithfield on anytime or the USDA or the AVMA, is how can you say something's humane if you d are not monitoring what's happening in there? And then uh, basically saying when they did go in there and put uh, hidden cameras in, what they found was... Um, animals screaming and in distress. And frankly, we don't want to show very much to scare people, but we can show you a tiny little, you know, uh, snippet of it so that you can get a sense. I descended 26 feet underground into the pit of the gas chamber in the West Coast's largest pig slaughterhouse, Smithfield's Farmer John. And what I learned was worse than I feared. The obligation of the USDA is to supervise the stunning and killing of animals and to issue suspensions when they see them being made to suffer. But here, the USDA isn't supervising the chamber, so I used a camera to show the public what they don't want us to know. Uh, yeah, so again, that tells the story. The last thing I'll, I'll play is a little bit, just a snippet of what she says she saw and recorded, and... Again, it's been in the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, Wired Magazine, and each of those articles, uh, I certainly know the New York Times and Wired linked to the actual video. According to legal experts and veterinarians, these gas chambers, please join me and go to stopgaschambers.org to learn how you can help. The group Direct Action Everywhere projected secretly recorded video of pigs in chambers filled with carbon dioxide gas. Veterinarians don't think it's humane. Lawyers don't think it's humane. There is no humane way to kill animals who do not want to die. So that little yeah, that you saw, that goes on for hours uh, in terms of the video they recorded, the actual time in the chamber is approximately four minutes. And the question is, how long does it take for the carbon dioxide to do its work and render these animals out of it? And uh, so that's the question. I certainly don't have any answers. I invite Smithfield. I invite uh, the USDA. I invite the AVMA on any time. But in a situation like this, considering there are similar gas chambers around the nation and the world for that matter, and that um, a group of something like 90 veterinarians said this is not humane, it, it, they felt it was illegal. What does the law do about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does not shield these companies from state prosecution and or civil litigation, that they're getting rubber stamped by the USDA or the ABMA. You have to remember something about factory farming and all 
forms of institutionalized animal cruelty. The whole business model was based on the idea of maximizing the number of animals and minimizing the number of caregivers uh, and therefore your labor costs. That's the business model. You maximize uh, profit by minimizing care. The whole model is built on cruelty. And as I said, I've, I've been 20 years putting in lots of, act, of, of activists and investigators into facilities to find out what was going on. I never found one that wasn't engaged in some form of institutional cruelty for which there could have been a strong argument made for prosecution. But you don't see it oftentimes because companies have a lot more sway with prosecutors and with state officials and federal officials than uh, activists do. But the bottom line is the USDA is part and parcel of the factory farm industry. Um, they really are indistinguishable in many ways from it. So their statements really shouldn't be counted for much. And the, and the ABMA has explicitly decided to prioritize profits over animal welfare. They declined internal resolutions that would have elevated animal welfare over profiting over the abuse of animals, and they declined to do it. They've green-lighted foie gras. They've green-lighted ventilator shutdown. They've done other things that show that they took a profession meant to help animals, and they used it in order to make money. And therefore, if I'm looking for an opinion, I don't go to the ABMA. I go to Our Honor and Crystal Heath. Crystal's the founder, and Our Honor is a group of veterinarians that work with others, like the Humane Society and Veterinary Medical Association. These are veterinarians that are doing the right thing. They're upholding their oaths, uh, and and so they're a much more reliable source. And again, I mean, I think I think what you're seeing, the truth that you're seeing, would not be possible if it weren't for activists taking these risks and these activists need support that's the idea well i want to talk to you about the necessity defense because this is an argument in court where activists are saying look we our first impulse is not to go in there and rescue animals and pull them out our first option is to go to law enforcement and say here's the video, something terrible is happening, do something. And then when law enforcement de declines to do anything, uh, then ultimately there's no other option to help that animal other than to go in and rescue the animal. And this is part of that right to rescue movement that is occurring. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the acquittal of Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesimer in a trial where they use the right to rescue to go in and rescue some dying piglets. But tell us about this necessity defense and is it effective and could it start being used more by people like Alexandra Paul, who is about to go on trial, the actress, March 7th here in California for rescuing a chicken from a slaughter truck as it was headed in uh, to the slaughterhouse to be killed. Right. I mean, I think the, the thing to think about the, the, necessity defense is it's absolutely a, a simple statement of morality. We have criminal laws that prohibit certain contact conduct because whatever the person would be doing, whatever they're engaged in is some form of wrong. But if that person can show that the thing that they're, the reason they're engaged in that conduct is to stop some greater evil, some greater harm from happening, uh, then, then they are not to be prosecuted. They're not guilty. And so the idea is very simple. And I think it's clearly the right idea. It's risky sometimes for activists to rely on that. One, it's been, as you can imagine, again, if our legal system is largely influenced by those in power uh, and corporations, they're not excited about that defense. So some courts have limited it. So it, it's not something activists can necessarily always rely on, although it can be used. I think the the as you've hinted at Jane, moving towards a right to rescue, uh, rights to document, rights to publicize, things that we the Constitution guaranteed, and that's why ag gags were struck down. Again, Justin Marceau was largely behind that. Uh, moving towards demand, not just a necessity defense, but demanding a right to go into places where innocent creatures are being tortured and killed for really no good reason. You, you All of the products, vegan products you promote, Jane, show that it's totally unnecessary. T to have that right established both in precedent and 
statutorily, passing laws that enable us to safely go into facilities to document and to rescue. Same thing you would have if a dog is dying in a car with the windows closed on a hot day. You'd be able to rescue that dog. That's the right thing to do. And in some ways, it, it reflects the necessity of defense. Um, but ensuring that right, both through uh, precedent and ideally through statute, is a next level move for animal rights activists. And in some ways, it's it's the key to personhood in some ways, Jane, because Personhood is really just the rejection of propertyhood. Animals should not be property. And if they're not property, if they're not exclusively controlled and used by the owner, then other people should be able to monitor, access, and care for those animals. Same thing we have when it comes to protecting children. And so I think the necessity of defense is a great moral statement um, that we should be able to stop evils, uh, even sometimes when it may arguably violate the law. But it's not enough. I think we do need to move towards a right to rescue as you've already hinted at. Wow, there is so much to do. And frankly, it, it boils down to consumer choices and the law. I mean, to a large degree, those are the two things that are determining um, because consumer interests will determine what the manufacturers and the businesses do. They respond to consumer interests. And despite all the hit pieces on plant-based meats, it's still skyrocketing. Uh, vegan alternatives are skyrocketing. The number of vegan restaurants is growing exponentially globally. In fact, they're threatened. That's why you're starting to see hit pieces in the media, because I was in the media for 40 years. I can tell you that who keeps the lights on on mainstream media is meat, dairy, and pharmaceuticals. Those are the main advertisers. So uh, just like the USDA is run by a dairy industry trade group leader, Tom Vilsack, I mean, he has a dairy industry trade group leader running the United States Department of Agriculture. So he's he represents the dairy industry when he's not doing this. It's a revolving door. And so it's the same thing with media. Media is beholden to their advertisers. And so that's why we started Unchained TV, uh, to get these kinds of conversations. Carter Dillard and the other attorneys like him should be featured on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, and, you know, it takes these absolutely courageous undercover investigations to get any kind of coverage. We're going to take a short break here on Voice America Radio, but we're going to be back in a couple of seconds and we're staying live on Facebook. Um, thank you for supporting Unchained TV. We are a global streaming network for veganism, to promote the plant-based lifestyle for animal, compassionate animals, for um, human health, to reverse climate change. And we are still live on uh, Facebook. We're going to be back on Voice America Radio in a couple of seconds. But this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about Unshade TV. Uh, there, in fact, is Crystal Heath from uh, our honor. Uh, we shared a booth with her at the uh, Animal Vegan Advocacy Summit near Washington, D.C. And she is the head of an organization. She's a veterinarian herself and head of an organization called Our Honor. You can go to ourhonor.org and learn more about what she's doing to stand up to the AVMA, the American Veterinary Med Medicine Association, which has uh, been called upon by her and other veterinarians to uh, say, hey, uh, depopulation, mass depopulation, where they basically bake these animals alive is cruel. And uh, they, they, they haven't done it. In fact, uh, according to the veterinarians I've spoken to, including Dr. Crystal Heath, they've, they've really tried to silence them uh, from speaking up. And so, you know, veterinarians um, are, I think, in crisis. There's a lot of them that are very upset because they get into the business and they go to vet school because they love animals. And then they are some of them are redirected toward being in industries that are exploiting animals. And so they're ending up working in factory farms and slaughterhouses and laboratories. Is this my imagination or, or is there some truth to this, which is something that I've heard from quite a few veterinarians myself, which is what I say. That's why I say it, although I haven't done a scientific survey. That's absolutely what I'm hearing. I mean, I, I, there's a, there's a new generation 
it's not just veterinarians. I mean, I think younger people are more apt to question authority and to question whether a structure based on greed is sustainable. I mean, I think the climate crisis, which you mentioned, kicked this thinking into high gear. Everything we're doing now is only going to harm future generations, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Certainly meat industry is a disaster for the climate crisis. I mean, I don't know how industry officials can't think about what they're doing to their own grandchildren and, and not have some remorse and want to get out of it. And for veterinarians, it's really just as bad. I mean, I think the AVMA and the USDA were built on this idea of exploiting animals, even though in the past several decades, we've learned so much that should put animals on an equal moral footing uh, with with humans. And yet- And we're coming back in 10 yeah. seconds um, to our Voice America broadcast. So uh, we'll be standing by for our reopen music. Thank you so much, Carter. Thank you. To Unchained TV on Voice America Radio, I'm Jane Velez Mitchell, and you are now re-entering a portal to a transformative way of living. I would love to welcome you back to Unchained TV's fascinating discussion with Carter Dillard, who has... Um, really been one of the main forces, although he's very humble and always wants to acknowledge everybody else. But uh, the Animal Activist Legal Defense Project is something that he is helping to lead. And it is absolutely crucial for those who care about animals because so much of it ends up in a court of law where uh, it's decided whether these animals are going to be protected or not. The perfect example is Prop 12. The California voters passed it and basically said, we don't want uh, the product of extreme cruelty. Um, animals kept in conditions where they can't turn around and they go stark raving mad. We don't want that sold in California. Given that California is the fifth largest economy in the world, it has massive ripple effects. The meat industry has gone all the way to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has sided with the meat industry against um, the people of California, uh, and we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do, uh, whether they knock down Prop 12 or not. I, I literally pray that they don't, because that would be such a step backward. When are we going to find out about that, Carter? I mean, the decision is is pretty imminent now. I think people are expecting it in the next several weeks, um, and obviously agree with you, it would be uh, a real blow if it were knocked down. But there are, in everybody's state, there are options for pushing against institutionalized animal cruelty and ending factory farming. There are proliferation of proposed bans on confined animal feeding operations going on around the country. More and more activists are taking the risk of documenting what's going on in facilities and lawyers should be supporting them. So I don't think we should be too down if we see that, and I also, if we do see it fall, and I also want to say, it's not unlike uh, the slight upside you see when the powers that be strike back uh, at people that are vulnerable. And you saw that when it came to the feminist movement and the Supreme Court in Dobbs uh, striking back at a right of a woman to terminate her pregnancy. So when the power structure is threatened by the people, they overreact. And if you see that, you know that on a long arc of justice, you're probably winning uh, when a court has to take away what is clearly moral progress. And I also want to say one thing, Jane, I, in the beginning, I, I wanted to mention, we're also, the Animal Activist Legal Defense Project is overseen by and really supported by other co-founders. Amy Trakinski, who's a great leader and a great animal attorney, who's responsible for a lot of the defense of activists over the past several decades, was seminal in, in setting this up. Cheryl Leahy, uh, who runs, as you know, Animal Outlook, is part of it. And your own team, Vita Moazes, is on the advisory board. So it's a lot of people working to support activists around the country because the model is really simple. You could have, you know, 15 animal protection organizations dominating the landscape. Let's say they have 30 or 40 or 50 people in each organization. They can do a certain amount of work. But if you were to essentially empower thousands, tens of thousands, maybe more, maybe hundreds of thousands of activists around the country, you can do a lot more work. You've suddenly quintupled uh, the impact that you can have for animals 
Can you imagine what that would look like if they felt safe because they'd have an attorney behind them? And that's the idea behind the project. Let's just, it's great to have organizations, but let's move to a grassroots empowerment model because you'll have a lot greater impact. So that's the idea behind it. And we're thankful to people like Amy for getting us here. Oh, yeah. It's a fantastic idea because if you don't have, it doesn't matter what the situation is. If you got a problem with uh, your condo association, if you don't have a lawyer, <laughs> you're, you're kind of like, you know what it. So um, I want to ask you about the trial of Wayne Chung and Paul Picklesimer, which was absolutely fascinating. And we did wall to wall coverage. And uh, the jury in conservative Utah found Wayne and Paul not guilty on all counts. I mean, this is absolutely amazing after they went into a Smithfield slaughter, uh, excuse me, factory farm and uh, rescued two piglets. And uh, it was considered a slam dunk case for the prosecution. But um, Wayne Shung, who defended himself, uh, showed well, this is one of the evidence photos, and I won't uh, linger on it too long that these animals had no value that there there were millions of tons of them discarded like trash and that therefore if you steal something and it doesn't have any value did you commit a crime and uh th they've actually talked to the jurors and i know you've been involved in that so tell us what you learned from the jurors because this is a conservative rural uh state where this was one of the biggest employers and yet uh, they were acquitted on all counts for going in there and rescuing the animals. And of course they videotaped uh, their entire rescue and the court didn't even let them play the videotape of them committing the crime. Now I covered crimes for years. When you get, that's, that's considered like the golden ticket when you get video of a crime in progress. And yet because the defense videotaped them committing the crime in progress to show with 3D cameras, no less, high-tech cameras, to show what's really going on inside these facilities. Um, the court didn't let them play that because they thought it would upset the jurors too much and they'd make an emotional decision. Exactly. I mean, I think so. The, the, the narrow legal question is, of course, whether the companies valued uh, the animals at all. And what you see from the investigation is clearly they did not. Uh, and that gives jurors some room um, to do what they did and make sure that the activists are not prosecuted. The, what you're seeing in reaction, so you're re, you're seeing uh, jurors, everyday people. These are not necessarily liberal, conservative, or any particular uh, shade of political leaning. They are everyday people that want to do the right thing. And when confronted with this investigation and the horrors, it was clear that that factory farms do not value animals. And the right, they got to the right result. What happens? Immediately the legislature. Again, you're looking at the centers of power, whether it's the Biden administration, prosecutors, the USDA, the AVMA, under pressure from companies. That's just straight up corruption uh, when we're talking about financial pressure being applied. You're looking now at the legislature in Utah intervene to try to change the law to present that, prevent that result from happening again. So the legislature and the companies behind it reach in to the courtroom and prevent, this is the whole reason we have a jury system, is to prevent this sort of corruption from happening. Pre they're attempting to prevent jurors from doing what they did in this case in the future. Uh, and so I think the main takeaway that I see from what you saw in St. George is, this is the development of a true social justice movement where activists at risk to themselves, felony prosecution, documented the truth. Everyday people, Main Street people took action uh, to ensure that these activists um, were not prosecuted uh, because what they did was, in fact, the right thing. And then you have concentrations of power. The people that are profiting from torturing animals to death, um, essentially stepping in to try to change the process. So again, I think the good news is you're seeing concentrations of power at the top overreact. They're overreacting to people who are changing their diet, veterinarians who are breaking away from the abuse and animal for profit model. And these, these concentrations overreact. And that shows some good news. It shows that I think that they're worried about how when people know the truth, uh, they do the right thing. And it's only the fact that factory farms uh, and other forms of institutional animal cruelty are just 
black boxes. They're just invisible. That is why they continue to operate. When the truth comes out, they can't do what they're doing. Let's hear the final words from Wayne Shung, who represented himself during his closing argument. Things that will happen in this world. Companies will be a little more compassionate to the creatures under their stewardship. Governments will be a little more open to animal cruelty complaints. And maybe, just maybe, a baby pig like Lily won't have to starve to death on the floor of a factory farm. The animals of this earth have given us so much. Maybe you probably know this yourself. They've given us food, they've given us clothing, they've even given us their love. If you have a dog and a cat in your home, as I do. All they've asked for us in return is to be good stewards of their welfare. To recognize what Rick Pittman recognized. That we all have a duty to be kind. And your decision today, if you make a good one, will make the world a little bit of a kinder place, even for a baby pig in a factory farm. Thank you very much. Wow, I choke up when I watch that. Woo. And, you know, the jurors responded. And um, it was it really backfired. If the idea was to scare activists and say, don't you dare go in there and document this stuff and take out dying animals, uh, it backfired. So you did some kind of um, major summit where you discuss this case. What were your takeaways? And tell us about that summit, Carter. Yeah, I mean, again, I have to, to credit University of Denver, Justin Marceau, largely who, who organized it. But the idea really is perhaps one of the core questions for animal lawyers and for animal law is uh, what would it mean from move, to move animals from property to being to a, a level of personhood if in documenting conditions, if shown to everyday people on a jury, uh, what is their reaction? Uh, when you say, well, these animals were stolen, even though the company could show no, that they were not valuing the animals. Uh, what's their reaction to that kind of a scenario, to that situation? And the jurors decided to do the right thing. Um, they, we believe, in fact, that juries all around the country would do the right thing. So if there is a right to rescue, if these companies can't fully control or reduce animals, to property, but in fact, activists have the right to document, the right to liberate uh, animals in certain conditions. That's really a movement towards animal personhood. It's a new, it's a movement towards animal rights and towards animal liberation. And in some ways, the purest form, because we're not just relying on judges or regulators or even politicians to say, well, we're finally gonna decide to do something for animals and declare a judge declares this animal's a, you know a person or a legislature decides to 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 pass protections for animals what we're looking at are everyday people deciding to do the right thing because what they're seeing is wrong and in that in that sense Jane it is in some ways the cutting edge of animal law and again I'm really just supporting but I have to support and and give credit to people like Justin Marceau and Amy Trakinski Vito Moazes, Jennifer Jones Benito, Chris Carraway, who's the core defense attorney behind all of it, they are pushing forward animal liberation in practice and at a volume, because again, if you can get activists, tens of thousands or more activists around the country to understand they have legal rights, they have legal protection, that's a social justice movement. It's relying on people and not just the, the concentrations of power at the top, which not only have failed to protect animals over the past several decades, they ensured things like the climate crisis, massive inequality, uh, really moving back into the Stone Age when it comes to the treatment of women. Um, and so I think we're looking at a, at a bottom up social justice movement. This is a, a big change. Let's talk about the ag gag laws, because that's the other big thing. We've got these court cases where like Baywatch actress Alexandra Paul is going to court, by the way, Unchained TV will be providing coverage with a team of legal experts. Frankly, I'd love to invite you on right now to be one of those legal experts. We just heard back from several who've agreed to take part. 
And uh, we're going to be following that trial. We're also going to have somebody on the ground in Merced, California, bringing us the very latest as Alexandra uh, goes into court and out of court. So please watch Unchained TV, our global streaming network for that. It'll be on UnchainedTV.com. It'll be on the app which I urge you to download. It's free right on your phone. You can download it by just putting the words Unchained TV into your app store. You can also download it on Amazon Fire Stick, your Roku device, your Apple TV device. And we have great news. It's about to go up on all Samsung televisions. You just put in Unchained TV in the search bar and it will show up. Uh, you can use that QR code right now to uh, get uh, all the information you need to download. We're the only, only vegan animal rights streaming network in the world. There are other nature documentaries being shown in other streaming networks, but we cover animal rights as well as the vegan movement. And so we do need the support of the vegan animal rights community uh, to share out our videos like this one. You could share it out to somebody who maybe you have a friend who's an attorney uh, and, uh, He's not a vegan or she's not a vegan attorney or an animal rights attorney, but they look at this and they go, hey, it makes sense. So that's how we're going to get the word out to um, people who aren't vegan because uh, these streaming device users are looking for content, free content, and we're absolutely free. So that being said, um, let's talk about the other big issue, the ag gag laws, because another way that the, I would call it the meat industrial complex is tr trying to fight back is by um, creating ag gag laws. How many are there and where do they stand? And what are they? Yeah, I mean, so there are several states around the nation that pass laws essentially prohibiting documenting and publicizing animal cruelty within uh, institution systems of institutional animal abuse. It's what I heard one major PR expert call the biggest gaffe you can imagine. Let's make it illegal to document what's going on inside our company. You might as well have admitted that you're blatantly committing animal cruelty. But not only was it a, a PR gap, it was also a violation of our constitutional protections that ensure freedom of speech, ability to document, uh, in many cases, ability to access what's going on. Because in essence, ag gag laws are exactly what they sound like. They're prohibitions on speech and not just on speech. They're politically targeting uh, a social justice movement like animal protection. So courts have in sort of various levels found those laws to be unconstitutional. And what the, the there's sort of a dance going on where legislatures will then alter the laws to try to get around uh, the, the court's decisions. Again, what you're seeing is legislatures really flouting the will of the people, and in this case, constitutional rights. So that's a process that will continue to unfold. But the good news is that ag, -AG laws are not proliferating around the country as they were when, when um, legislatures first had the idea to start banning speech. And in fact, the reason they're not proliferating is because of court cases uh, that were brought by attorneys like Justin Marceau, who uh, helped stop, stop the, um, the proliferation. Now, I think there's another... As we just as we talked about, Jane, necessity of defense is something that's helpful, but not ideal. Maybe we want to move towards a right to rescue. I think there's a real open question as to whether ag gag laws uh, are something that we can start to reverse, both at the federal level by ensuring whistleblower access to facilities. Certainly rights to rescue may imply rights to document. Um, and, and there's also a consumer protection angle right now. The lawyer the name of the game in animal protection law when it comes to consumer products is going after animal products for false advertising. You cannot mm -hmm. produce these products without generally having to, to omit how these animals are treated. But you can actually require disclosure, start to require legislatively and otherwise uh, animal uh, companies to tell us how they're producing their products, how they're producing their services, mandate the truth, mandate a glass wall. And I think that's the next frontier. So it's not just being on the defense with ag, knocking down ag gag laws, it's going on the offense to require disclosure. I think that's the next game. Wow, well, there's so much uh, going on. We've got a caller, Tom in Chicago, your question or thought for Carter Dillard. 
Hi, Jane. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question was, you touched on it briefly a little bit in the last segment. Uh, my question was, these animals are basically poisoned. This, ga- this gas is toxic. How can people that consume animals that are poisoned not be poisoned themselves? Would this travel on to the consumer? If this is toxic, this should be listed. I don't know if consumers that eat uh, pigs and so forth are aware that the animal they're consuming was, was slaughtered in such a fashion. And would this carry on to the consumer? Uh, thank you for taking my question. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, there is probably less of a concern with consumer safety for products that are actually entering the market. I mean, you'll a lot of the arguments for veganism and for plant-based consumption does arise from human health concerns, less from toxicity in the products themselves, although there are, there are exceptions. Um, so I don't know that that would be the main driver relative to something like the, the torture these animals experience. Um, and one of the dangers of, of veganism is a lot of times we may want to engage in it because it is healthy. Jane showcases a lot of vegans that show t- massive transformation in, in their lives uh, because of leaving animal products. But we don't want to leave the real, I think the fundamental reason we want to make this change, the long-term reason we want to make this change is because it is wrong to treat innocent creatures this way. It's right to liberate them. And there's great research coming out of Pax Fauna, an organization that's done research on messaging that points towards this idea of messaging animal protection. And it's paxfauna.org, P-A-X-F-A-U-N-A.org, messaging around not just the health implications, but also the political implications, uh, which are essentially, it's a form of oppression. It's a form of social injustice to have this happening with, with animals. And it's something we can change. It's so interesting you say that because so often we hear people say, well, you know, the animal um, welfare issue doesn't really resonate. People are more interested in veganism because it'll improve their health. Um, And, you know, it's really hard to say. I would say it really depends on the individual. Um, And I'm sure that there are a lot of studies trying to determine the most effective way to reach people. I would say it's multi-determined. Different people respond differently. You know, people say, don't shame people into going vegan. I was shamed. I was a vegetarian. And Howard Lyman, who had been on Oprah uh, talking about, he's a fourth generation cattle rancher turned vegan activist, came in. He said, I hear you're a vegetarian. I said, yes. He said, do you eat dairy? I said, yes. And he said, liquid meat pointed right at my nose and I went vegan. So I was shamed into going vegan. So I'm not suggesting everybody should be shamed into going vegan. What I am suggesting is that different approaches for different people. If he had said, well, I think maybe you should reduce your dairy consumption because I probably wouldn't have heard it, but he, he got my attention and it's the best thing that I've ever done. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to him. So it, it's really hard to come up with a one size fits all for turning people uh, or turning turning people on to this other way of living. That's why, for example, on Unchained TV, we have a whole bunch of different kinds of documentaries. We have nature documentaries. We have cooking shows. We have reality TV shows like Pig Little Eyes. We've got um, music videos. So you never know what is going to impact somebody and touch their heart. And, uh, you know, we've got to try everything. And that's why we started a streaming network, because why should uh, only the, the the carnists who are promoting meat and dairy be able to reach a global network, a global audience? A, a, approximately a third of the human population has access to streaming devices. So that's a lot of people and we've got to reach them. So what's next for, we only have about a minute, what's next for your incredible project? What do you plan to do next? I mean, so the Animal Activist Legal Defense Project will expand its network to ensure that activists around the country feel and understand that they can get legal protection, uh, that they have rights, and that as part of growing a social justice movement, uh, they are offered the legal services they need. I do think, Jane, the other thing to remember is it is important that there are lots of different reasons people might go vegan. But it can't just be left up to consumers. Animal cruelty laws exist because whether consumers want it or not, these companies should not be allowed to engage in cruelty. And if they engage in it, 
they should be prosecuted. The company should be prosecuted. And at the very least, they should be civilly enjoined. So there also is a moral movement to require the government to do its job. That's really what animal law is about. And that, that reason, even though there are lots of reasons people might go vegan, the reason that we don't want uh, blatant oppression, violent forms of, of top-down oppression, that's the reasoning that links us to other social justice movement, whether it's protecting women's right to choose, whether it's protecting uh, other oppressed communities from this, these concentrations of power, that's a larger social justice issue. And what one thing that the project intends to do is to link up, link arms with other social justice movements to create political change. Because the animal rights movement can't be siloed off just as vegans. We have to be part of a larger movement to end the oppression of innocence. And that's what the big long arc of justice calls us to do. Uh, we are out of time, but I want to thank you, Carter Dillard. You are an inspiration. I know you're a very busy attorney. Thank you for spending an entire hour with us. And uh, UnshadeTV.com will have an article detailing not only this interview, but all the work of this incredible project, as well as links where you can support. If you're attorneys, get involved. They need you. See you next time on Unshade TV. Download the app, people. Thank you.